Well, welcome you guys. Good to have you here tonight. We're going to, a couple quick announcements. Uh, Men's discipleship last night was awesome. All you ladies missed it. Sorry about that, but uh, it was a good study. Uh, But that just brings up that tomorrow night, uh, ladies' discipleship is going to be on. It's here at church at 630. And so I hope you guys are able to enjoy that. And then we got the work day coming up on Saturday, and that starts at 830 in the morning. And we'll go to about 1 o'clock just until it gets kind of hot, and we'll stop. Uh, And we'll have lunch together and stuff. Looking forward to that. And then uh, if uh, if you're going to come, bring gloves, uh, weeding materials, you know, stuff like that. We've got actually lots of weeding sticks and stuff, but uh, bring gloves anyway. And then uh, Monday is July 4th. We're going to have a July 4th barbecue, and I'm looking forward to that. Uh, There's a sign-up on the counter. The church is going to provide burgers and hot dogs and stuff, and uh, uh, I'm looking forward to that very much. You guys bring the side dishes, and it'll be great. And then uh, the Reno Aces is coming up, and uh, Shelly, how much are the tickets? Yeah, so the price went down. Yeah, so uh, it make, makes it a little, uh, little easier to buy your hot dog but uh, <laughs> with the change. But uh, looking forward to that very much. And we're buying tickets for everyone that signed up. And then we're going to collect the money after that. We'll send Guido after you. Uh, and then um, uh, September 10th is the uh, Women's Conference at Little Country Church in Reading. And uh, uh, you can sign up for that on July 15th online. The cost is 25 bucks, And, uh, you know... Uh, God is good. Father God, thank you for bringing us here tonight. Thank you for the opportunity to worship you, to study your word, and and just to commune with you. And so guide us in that, Father. Help us to please you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're able, let's uh, stand together as, as we worship.
Father God, that's our prayer, Lord, that you would change our hearts, that you would reconcile us to you completely, Lord, that we would be yielded to everything you want to do, and that we would have a different heart, Lord, your heart, be men and women after your heart. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for this time. Guide us through it, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Well, hey, why don't you turn and say hello to each other real quick. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> My wife's getting reacquainted with the fellowship <laughs> after a three-year absence or three-week three, three week absence. <laughs> hey, tonight we're going to be in Jeremiah chapter 8 as we continue in our track through uh, Jeremiah and through the Bible. And so if you will, open up your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 8. Uh, we'll read it together, then we'll, we'll go back and we'll study it through. And so uh, if you would... Uh, Open your Bibles up and stand up with me uh, in reverence uh, for God's word. Jeremiah chapter 8, beginning now at verse 1, it says, At that time, says the Lord, they shall bring out the bones of the kings of Judah and the bones of its princes and the bones of the priests and the bones of the prophets and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem out of their graves. Uh, they shall spread them before the sun and the moon and all the hosts of heaven. And they, the, which they have loved and which they have served and after which they have walked and which they have sought and which they have worshipped, uh, they shall not be gathered nor buried. They shall be like refuse on the face of the earth. Uh, then death shall be chosen rather than life by all the residue of those who remain in this evil family, uh, who remain in all places, all the places where I have driven them, says the Lord of hosts. Moreover, you shall say to them, thus says the Lord, uh, uh, will they fall and not rise? Will they turn away and not return? Uh, why is this people slidden back, uh, Jerusalem, uh, in a perpetual backsliding? Uh, they hold fast to deceit. They refuse to return. I listened and heard, but they did not speak or write. Nor, no man repented of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his own course uh, as the horse rushes into battle. Uh, even the stork in the heavens knows her appointed times, and the turtle dove, the swift, and the swallow observe the time of their of their coming uh, but my people do not know the judgment of the lord uh, how, how can you say we are wise and the law of the lord is with us uh, look at the false pen of the scribe certainly works falsehood uh, the wise men are ashamed they are dismayed and taken uh, behold they have rejected the word of the lord so that so what wisdom do they have uh, therefore i will give their wives to others and their fields to those who will inherit them because from the least, even to the greatest, everyone is given to covetousness. Uh, from the prophet, even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. Uh, for they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, uh, saying, peace, peace, uh, where there is no peace. Uh, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? No, uh, they were not at all ashamed, nor did they know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall, uh, in the time of their punishment, they should be cast down, says the Lord. I will surely consume them, says the Lord. Uh, no grapes shall be on the vine, uh, nor figs on the fig tree. 
and the leaf shall fade, and the things I have given them shall pass away from them. Uh, why do we sit still? Uh, assemble yourselves. Let us enter the fortified cities. Let us be silent. Uh, be silent there, for the Lord our God has put us to silence, and given us to given us water of gall to drink, because we have sinned against the Lord. Uh, we looked for peace, but no good came, uh, and for a time of health, and, and there was trouble. The snorting of his horses was heard from Dan. Uh, the whole land trembled at a sound of the neighing of his strong ones, for they have come and devoured the land and all that is in it, the city and those who dwell in it. Uh, for behold, I will send serpents among you, vipers which cannot be charmed, and they shall bite you, says the Lord. I will comfort myself in sorrow. Uh, my heart is faint in me. Listen. Uh, the voice of the cry of the daughter of my people from a far country. Is not the Lord in Zion? Is not her king in her? Why have they provoked me to anger uh, with their carved images, with foreign idols? Uh, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. For the hurt of the daughter of my people, I am hurt. I am mourning. Uh, astonishment has taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Uh, why then is there no recovery uh, for the health of the daughter of my people. Gracious Father, again, we read these words and we stand in awe of who you are. And we ask, Lord, that you would give us understanding in these things, that you would be the one to instruct us tonight, uh, that you would guide us in your ways. Have your way, Lord. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. As we read these words, I, I don't know. Uh, uh, looking at verse 1, it says, At that time, he says, says the Lord, they shall bring out the bones of the kings of Judah and the bones of the, its princes and the bones of the priests and the bones of the prophets and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem out of their graves. I, I think God's got a bone to pick with them. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, uh, it, it's really something uh, when you read the, the entirety of this and keep going uh, to see what the Lord's going to allow to happen. One of the things that I've noticed when we, when we studied through Isaiah, and, and as I've read through thus far, you know, studied through Jeremiah, leading up to this chapter, and every single chapter, from, from chapter 1 through chapter 7, there's been some mention of the mercy of God and the grace of God. There's been some opportunity, you know, if you'll just stop messing around and, you know, repent of your sins, you know, that this can be altered. This could be changed in some way. This chapter ends that. Uh, I don't see any grace. I don't see any mercy. Uh, I'll, all I've seen in this chapter is the, the judgment of the Lord is going to befall those who have rejected his word, and it's going to be very, very severe, to the point where at the end of this chapter, the prophet's weeping. To the point at, at the end of this chapter, I, it looks almost like God is weeping uh, because of the terrible things that are going to be happening uh, to the people as a result of, and I, just the generic part of this is rejecting God's word. Uh, in verses 1 and 2, you know, as he talks about exposing their bones and digging them up and stuff, in verse 2 it says, They shall spread them over the sun, or before the sun and the moon, and all the host of heaven, uh, which they have loved, which they have served, and after which they have walked, uh, which they have sought, which they have worshipped, uh, they shall be they shall not be gathered nor buried. They shall be like refuse on the face of the earth. And so, between verses one and two, uh, he's describing uh, the desecration and the dishonor that's going to happen to the people. Now, bear in mind, Jeremiah is still standing in the gates of the temple. He, he, in the previous chapter, he was called to the gates. He was called to you know, tell the people they're coming into worship. Uh, and they're kind of being rebuked because they're, they're coming into worship ostensibly. There's the outer appearance of that. But what's happening on the inside is they're just really going through the motions. And he calls them on it. And so this is still the, uh, <coughs> this is still the middle of that, that message, if you will. Uh, he's telling the people that when they are conquered... Uh, the Babylonians will desecrate the graves of the kings and the princes. Uh, the bones of the priests and the prophets will be scattered about, uh, partly because in, in the culture of that day, like the Egyptians, you know, like King Tut. Uh, many of us saw the King Tut exhibit. Uh, King Tut was buried with a whole bunch of his treasure. 
and a whole bunch of his, you know, uh, servants and all those kinds of things. And so it was common in that day when the nobles were buried, uh, they were buried with valuables. And so when the when the Babylonians come and when they conquer the city, when when the, all the, the 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 military part of it's over with, they're going to go through the city with a fine tooth comb, trying to extract anything of any value. And so they're going to go into the tombs of the kings and the priests and the prophets. You know, maybe they had a gold tooth, maybe they had a ring on their finger or whatever. And they're going to go through all that stuff and just chuck the bones out in the street uh, and desecrate the graves, looking for the valuables. But at the same time, uh, doing whatever they can to demean uh, the Jewish people. Uh, it, it, it's a conquering that is so absolute and complete. And, and this is part of the description. Josiah kind of, in a sense, did some of the same things with the false prophets and those who worshipped uh, the abominations and the pagan idols. Uh, he took their bones and ground them up. He took the, the, the idols and the, the statues or whatever, you know, and ground them into powder and sprinkled them on the, uh, uh, the tombs, if you will, of these false prophets and stuff. Uh, but the Babylonians are going to, you know, he didn't dig up their bones and throw them out there, uh, but the Babylonians will do that. And, and it'll be a thorough um, desecration, if you will, uh, of their tombs. Uh, they worshipped uh, the sun and the moon, the host of heaven. Uh, they walked after other gods, and God knew about it. Uh, and and it, he, he recorded it. I mean, it, it mattered to him. And, and these are all things that should rightly have been directed to God. I mean, think about this, as, as, as the prophet describes this, um, which you have loved, uh, which you have served, uh, which you've walked after, which you have sought and, and worshipped, aren't these things that we should be doing for God? I mean, we should love him and worship him and walk after him and seek him diligently, all those things. And these are they gave to these pagan gods all the things that God truly wants from us. And, uh, and, and so he, he allows them really to pay that kind of a price. And, and it's interesting because they worshipped uh, all these things. Now they're thrown out. In, into the daylight, to the streets or the fields or whatever, and now their bones will forever be before the sun and the moon and the host of heaven. And uh, they worshiped in life. Now they can, in a sense, kind of worship, you know, in death. Uh, but it was just utter foolishness. Um, it was, it was all, all this was given to the creature, the creation, rather than the creator. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1, verse 22, uh, professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And so now their bones will be cast out and they will continue their worship uh, in that way. Later, in, um, you know, and you talk about, it was a big deal to the Jews uh, to be buried with their fathers. It was a big deal for the Jews, you know, to have an honorable burial. And, uh, and here, obviously, the, the Babylonians are going to undo that. But later on, in uh, Jeremiah 22, verses 18 and 19, here we read, Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning Jehoiakim. Now, Jehoiakim was a wicked, evil king. And uh, it says that he was the son of Josiah, the king of Judah. And then it says about him, he should be buried with the burial of a donkey and dragged and cast out between the gates of Jerusalem. And so, you know, here's a guy that, that God did not, you know, like. In fact, he even renamed him Coniah, as opposed to Jeconiah, because he, the Je and the Jeconiah is the word for God, okay? And then Coniah. I don't remember what that means, but uh, the bottom line is God didn't want to be connected to him. <laughs> and so, you know, he's renamed in the Bible, but, he's, but we're told he's, got the, he's going to have the burial of a donkey. You know, I, I don't really care what happens to me when I go. Uh, you know, uh, bury me in the backyard, burn me up, send me somewhere, but don't throw me out in the street, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, that would be kind of rough, crummy. And, and that's what's happening here. It's, it's all about desecration and dishonor. And Jeremiah is telling them that, that this is what's going to happen. He is prophesying, really, of the near future. Uh, in verse 3, he says, Then death shall be chosen rather than life by all the residue of those who remain of this evil family. 
uh, who remain in all the places where I've driven them, says the Lord of hosts. And so the descendants of uh, the king, the descendants of uh, the priests and the prophets uh, that have been doing these wicked things, I don't think it's a, it's a curse, if you will, upon the whole nation, but it talks about this family. Uh, this royal family would be another way to put it. And, uh, and, and it says that you know, death shall be chosen by these descendants whose bones are being cast out, the remnant of these wicked people who have engaged in a lifestyle that leads to death. And, and it's interesting that they would choose death that way because people don't realize when they reject salvation, when they reject uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ, they are literally choosing death and don't even know it. You know, and, and, and don't believe that. But Moses tells us back in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, he says, I call heaven and earth as witness today against you that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. This verse has always impacted me because, you know, for each of us, the, the choices that we make, and I look, in, I look in this room, and we're mostly an older crowd tonight, and, you know, the, the choices that we make impact our kids and impact our grandkids. So it's not just a choice for us, but it's a legacy that we would leave behind. And here it's the same thing. They've, they've chosen poorly, and, uh, and they've chosen a worldly lifestyle uh, that will sadly lead to death. And, and maybe in a sovereign way, one of the grandkids, you know, hears the gospel and gets saved and breaks that cycle. But by and large, that's pretty much what happens. In the time of the Babylonian siege, life will be so terribly hard uh, that to some that death will be preferable to life under the Babylonians, and they will choose death. There's a, a practical and a spiritual way of looking at that. Uh, in verse 4, it says, Moreover, you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord, uh, Will they fall and not rise? Will they, will they turn away and, and not return? And, and these are a couple of rhetorical questions. I had to read it three or four times to get it. Uh, will they fall and not rise? And I say, yeah, they're not going to rise again. Uh, will they turn away and, and not return? Again, the answer, uh, I believe, is yes, they're not coming back. Things are not going to ever be like they were once before. You know, the, the, we read in Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16, for a, a righteous man uh, will fall seven times or may fall seven times and rise again, but the wicked shall fall by calamity. The righteous man will fall. I mean, we do. We stumble. But the, the wicked shall fall by calamity. They may not get up. The righteous man gets up. God gets us up. But that may not be true uh, of the wicked. Uh, it's natural for men to fall at times, I mean, in a physical way. When people fall down, they, they get back up. Sometimes you see a little kid fall like they're learning how to walk or they're just a toddler or whatever they are. And they fall down. And sometimes they just lay there and cry. And what do you say? Come on, get up. You know, sometimes you help them up or sometimes you just encourage them to get up. But that's a natural thing. When you fall down, you get up. But there will be times when people fall down and don't get up. And I don't just mean because they died. I'm talking about in a very spiritual sense. And you know, there's a lot of people uh, that have, in a sense, fallen away from the Lord or turned away from the Lord. Different things have happened in their lives. And, and for you know, they rebelled against God and just turned away. And, uh, and it's a season you know, in their life. And, and some of those people do repent. Uh, they rededicate their lives to the Lord. They come back and, and they, they, they engage in that living faith walk with God. But I just want to say that's never a guarantee because there are people that fall away and never come back. There are people that, you know, that they get deeper and deeper into whatever they got into and uh, it overtakes them in such a way that they don't get back. And so there's no guarantee. And here it's, he's saying they have fallen down and they're not getting back up. And, and that's, a, that's a harsh reality. You know, will one turn away and not return? Again, yes. They've turned from the Lord, and, and they won't turn back. They've refused. They've sealed their own fate. You know, typically when you're driving somewhere, and I, you know, one of the, my wife and I, we talk in the car all the time when we're driving. A lot of times the conversation goes like this. You missed our turn off. <laughs> You know, <laughs> you know, and you've done that where you're, you just, you're zipping down the freeway and you miss the turnoff or you're, you're going somewhere and you miss the road you're supposed to turn on. And what do you do? You drive down a little ways, you get, you know, get turned around, come back, and then you go the right way. You, you make the correction. And that's natural. That's, that's the smart thing to do. Sometimes people miss the turnoff, though, and they just keep going. 
you know, and then never really make it back. And, and that's kind of what he's talking about. Um, in verse 5, uh, it, it says, why what, has this people slidden back? Uh, Jerusalem is a perpetual backsliding. Uh, and then he gives us the answers. Uh, they hold fast to deceit and they refuse to return. You know, uh, why are they in such a backslidden state? And he gives us the reason. Number one, they hold fast to deceit, to dishonesty. You know, uh, in the next chapter, in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 6, he says, Your dwelling place is in the midst of deceit. Uh, through deceit, they refuse to know me, says the Lord. You know, and it says your dwelling place is in the midst of They are abiding in deceit. Jesus tells us to abide in him. They're going, no, we're going to abide in dishonesty. We're going to abide in the flesh. We're going to abide in, you know, worldly things. And so, and then it says there, again, in Jeremiah 9, 6, through deceit, they refuse to know me, says the Lord. So that's reason number one. Uh, they abide in deceit, and that's where they live. But the, the second reason he gives is because they refuse to return. They refuse to repent of their evil ways. And uh, repentance is so key. <clears throat> I've heard people share the gospel before in front of me where they don't talk about repentance. I say, no, 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 you've got to talk about repentance. You know, uh, changing our ways, walking in a different direction, living a different life. And, uh, you know, in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15, it says, For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning, that's repenting, in returning and rest, resting in his completed work, you shall be saved. In quietness and confidence should be your strength, but, but you would not. I mean, I love that verse, but those last four words, but you would not, just kill me. Because it, it, it's laid out for us right there. Previously in, in Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 3, he said, O Lord, are not your eyes on the truth? You've stricken them, but they have not grieved. You've consumed them, but they've refused uh, to receive correction. They've made their faces harder than rock. They've refused to return. And it's like, wow, that's, that's a deadly kind of a, 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 a rebellion. That's a, a, a deadly kind of stubbornness uh, that, you know, is very hard to get past. And the verse 6, it says, I listened and heard, uh, but they do not speak aright. Uh, no man repented of his wickedness, saying, you know, what have I done? Uh, everyone turned to his own course as the horse rushes into the battle. I know that horses are uh, intelligent animals, you know, uh, they're trainable and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, you, you get a horse fired up and just get it, you know, going. Um, they're not thinking, I wonder where we're going. Uh, you know, and they're going into a battle where they don't realize what a, the rider knows what's going on. But the horse is just running. And, uh, and, and sometimes people are like that. They go headlong into something, not realizing the danger they put themselves in or what the repercussions of that are going to be. And notice that uh, in the beginning of the verse here, I listened and heard. God is listening and hearing. He hears our conversations. I love it in Malachi 3.16 when it talks about you know, how God records our conversations, if you will. It's written down when we're talking about him. But apparently there's other books or other, other recordings where, you know, when we're talking about other stuff maybe that we shouldn't be talking about or, or, or evil plans or whatever, God is still listening because he says, I'm listening, but they do not speak aright. No man repented of his wickedness. He's waiting to hear certain words like, Lord, forgive me, or Lord, help me not to do that again, or Lord, I repent of that, you know. I mean, we are powerless at times. I know people get hung up in sin in, in, in bad ways that they are not able to extract themselves from that. But, but God, when we invoke his name, when we ask him to help, there's the power of the Holy Spirit. And he's waiting to hear those words, and he's not hearing it because they haven't repented. And then I, I read that phrase there that, that uh, says, I listened, no man repented of his wickedness, saying, what have I done? You can, you can read this actually a, a couple a couple ways. You know, what have I done? Like, you know, what's the big deal? Which I think is, you know, one of the ways they might have said that. Or, oh, no, what have I done? You know, I mean, it just depends on how the inflection and all those kinds of things. But basically, uh, they're not even acknowledging what they've done. What have I done? What's the problem? You know? And, uh, and everyone's basically doing their own thing. They're not abiding by the word of God because they've kind of, rejected that same thing same attitude i believe that we saw uh back in judges 
in uh, Judges chapter 17, verse 6. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. You know, uh, moral relativism or humanism. Uh, same kind of things that are happening today. Everyone's doing what's right in their own eyes. And, uh, and it's like, well, you know, uh, that, that's where law enforcement gets, you know, kind of sketchy. And that's where all these things happen. It's like, what's the standard anymore? And we're getting farther and farther away from any kind of standard. It's anarchy uh, in our culture. Because uh, from the word of God. And they're kind of doing their own thing. But, you know, if you're going to be uh, faithful, basically everyone's doing their own thing and just like what Isaiah laid out in Isaiah 53 verse 6 all we like sheep have gone astray and turned everyone to his own way as opposed to the way of the Lord uh, verse 7 it begins to compare us to animals that are smarter than we are uh, he says even the stork in the heavens knows her appointed times and the turtle dove the swift and the swallow observe the time of their coming but my people uh, do not know the judgment of the Lord and so, you know, the animals have got this figured out. <laughs> Bird-brained animals have got this figured out. Uh, but men are the problem. You know, the, the birds of the air know the times and the seasons, uh, the migrations. I lived in Southern California uh, for years and not too far from San Juan Capistrano. And every year on, on the same day of the year, the swallows came back. They would fly away in the winter. They would come back, you know, basically in the, in the summer. And, uh, and it was like clockwork. And they, they knew the migratory patterns. One of the coolest things about being in Israel is that it is the crossroads for, I mean, I, I don't know, many hundreds of thousands of birds and, and different species that fly back and forth from Africa to Europe and different places, and they all seem to want to fly over Israel. And, uh, you know, but it's really super cool because you see all these different kinds of birds, but the, the migratory patterns, all these things that they set, it's like they're bird brains. How, how do they know how to navigate? How do they get across the ocean? How do they do all these things? Because it's, it's God's given them that, that understanding, that wisdom, that instinctive thing to do. But men can't seem to figure out who their creator is. In fact, men now can't even figure out if they're men or women. You know, what's a man, what's a woman? You know, stupid questions to be asking. But it, it just tells you how far we've kind of gone. And, and yet, man instinctively knows that there is a God. Uh, he can see God in creation. He knows God is real in his conscience within. Uh, yet, he suppresses the truth because he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to turn to God. Uh, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1, uh, verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Skipping to verse 21, Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, um, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened darkened to the point where they're doing foolish, dumb things that will lead to their death. And, uh, and, and it just gets, kind of gets worse and worse. I think that we need to be more uh, like the sons of Issachar. Uh, in uh, 1 Chronicles 12, 32, it, it gives us a little bit of a description of these guys. It says, the sons of Issachar who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. I pray that all of us, like the sons of Issachar, have an understanding of the times that we live in. We are living in the last days. The hardest part about studying through Jeremiah is seeing the parallels to our country today, to our culture and our society today, and knowing in a certain sense that we're headed to the same fate. I don't think the Babylonians are coming, uh, but you know God's going to bring judgment upon us, I mean, for the wickedness of our ways. And, uh, you know, he, he didn't let Israel slide. I, I can't believe he's going to let the USA slide. And so you see all these things. And, 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 and the, one of the biggest challenges that we face as Christians today is not getting so distracted by the wicked things happening around us, but that we keep our eyes on Jesus, that we keep seeking after him and communing with him and worshiping him and, and trying to do the right thing and trying to influence our culture and trying to get people saved, you know, sharing the gospel. Then one day we're going to get called up to be with him. And what a glorious thing it's going to be. Then the world's really going to implode. But uh, <clears throat> in the meantime, uh, we abide in him. 
Now, in verses 8 and 9, it says, How can you say that we are wise <clears throat> and the law of the Lord is with us? Uh, look, these the, the false pen of the scribe certainly works falsehood. Uh, the wise men are ashamed. Uh, they are dismayed and taken. Behold, they have rejected the word of the Lord. You underline that phrase. Why is all this happening? They've rejected the word of the Lord. And how can you say you're a wise man? The fool, you know, the, the Bible describes or defines what a fool is. The fool said in his heart, there is no God. And, and you see today that so many are acting like there is no God. They'll never be held accountable for their actions. Or some even try to hide behind a facade of godliness or spirituality. Oh, I'm a Christian and blah, 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 and they say things and do things. And it's like they have no idea what the word of God says. How can you say that you are wise and the law of the Lord is with us uh, when you actually reject the law of the Lord? You know, <coughs> excuse me, as they're kind of invoking, hey, we've got the word of God. It, it sounds a little bit like what we saw back in chapter 7 when they would say, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, like, like that was going to protect them. And, uh, and, and sadly, it, it will be to no avail. Uh, the false pen described here, the false teachings of the scribe, you know, so-called, uh, work falsehood and, and, and have led so many astray. There are people that just, they want to hear what they want to hear. They want to be affirmed uh, in their, their sin. You know, they want to feel good about it, not, not feel the guilt that the Holy Spirit can bring or the, 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 uh, the conviction. Paul tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, it says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to fables. Uh, previously, when Jeremiah was describing what uh, uh, the false prophets were saying, uh, at one point he said, and the people would have it so, <laughs> you know, and it's like, that's pretty sad. Just, 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 you know, say something nice, you know, don't talk about sin and the blood and, you know, correction and all those kinds of things. Just tell me something, you know, sugary and sweet. I want to hear rainbows and, and unicorns tonight. And it's like, well, you might've come to the wrong place because Jeremiah has not given us rainbows and unicorns. <laughs> but in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 13, uh, the writer of Proverbs tells us, he who despises the word will be destroyed, uh, but he who fears the commandment will be rewarded. If you despise the word, that means you're not going to take heed to it. And if you don't take heed to God's word, you're not going to hear his voice. You're not going to hear his commands. You're not going to understand who he is. You're not going to, to repent of your sins. It's only when we hear his voice that we actually do those things. Uh, the word of God was in the temple. The word of God, I believe, is probably in the synagogues. Uh, perhaps even in their hands, but sadly not in their hearts. And, and that's where it needed to be. Uh, there was a, a serious disconnect then, uh, as there is today, between having God's word in your hand or on your bookshelf as opposed to in our hearts. <clears throat> I tell people all the time, the guys that I disciple with and stuff, it's not enough to know the scriptures from the standpoint of being able to quote it or, or being familiar with it. We have to apply it. There has to be that, that, that part of us that we take in God's word, we think it through, and then consider how we can apply it to our lives or, or how it's convicting us to, to, to start doing something we haven't been doing or to stop doing something we have been doing. But, but the, God's word would literally alter our lives. It, we can't just have, as so many do, an intellectual assent like, yes, that's right, and somehow not apply that uh, to our lives. You know, James tells us in, in James one twenty two, he says, be, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. If, if we're just a hearer, we are deceiving ourselves, but we have to be a doer. And so the question comes after a Bible study or after a time of reading, the, you know, your devotions or whatever time you spend in God's word, it's like, Lord, how would I apply this to my life? Lord, what do you want me to do with this? You know, I've got this information now, what do I do with it? And, uh, and it can't just be, you know, checking off a box on the reading list and moving on. And so being a doer of the word. Uh, in verse 10, therefore, I will give their wives to others and their fields to those who will inherit them. 
uh, because from the least even to the greatest, uh, everyone is given to covetousness. Uh, from the prophet even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. And so verse 10 starts off with that word, therefore, and it's kind of like, because of all these things, um, they're going to die uh, or be taken captive, and their wives are going to be given to the conquerors and their fields to others. I mean, <clears throat> uh, because everyone, it says here, from the least to the greatest, is given over to covetousness. You know, <clears throat> the, the, the Ten Commandments, covet not thy neighbor's stuff. It's a form of greed. It's a form of dissatisfaction. It's kind of blaming God, like I'm supposed to have this. You haven't given it to me, so I'm going to take it, whatever. Um, and, you know, they want more. Uh, it's like uh, that song, The Material Girl. You know, I live in a material world, and so I want more of everything, whatever. Um, and, and so uh, they've been given over to covetousness, and it says, um, from the prophet even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. They're, when they deal falsely, what are they doing? They're cheating people. <laughs> they're, they're conniving. They're, 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 they're like con artists, you know, working people out of their money. Uh, they're going to the widows and the orphans and taking their stuff, you know. Uh, doing whatever it takes to get ahead. And uh, the, the typical Wall Street climber kind of person, whatever. But, you know, Paul, again, <clears throat> wraps this up in a little different way. And uh, Paul tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 6, uh, beginning at uh, chapter 6, verse 6, it says, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. You can stop right there. You know, if you're okay with an iPhone 8, hang on to it. You don't need a 13. You know, I mean, godliness with contentment is great gain. We don't have to have <clears throat> a lot of stuff. I see a lot of people in third world countries that have relatively nothing compared to what we have, and they're very content. They're very happy. They're not stressed. They're not worried about who's going to steal their stuff because they don't have any stuff. You know, <laughs> and uh, it, it's a pretty cool way to live. And, you know, apparently these guys were got caught up in the materialism of the day. And he says, you know, they've, they've lost that contentment because of their covetousness. Uh, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Uh, and having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. But, verse 9, those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Why? For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, uh, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And this verse 10, for, you know, the love of money, it, it, it could read, is the root of all kinds of evil or is a root of all kinds? It doesn't matter so much. But the, the key part is for which some have strayed from the faith. They allowed their covetousness to take them away from the faith, pursuing these other things. And that's exactly what's being described here by Jeremiah and who's he talking about? He's not talking about the, uh, the, the drug dealer in the back alley there in Jerusalem. He's talking about the priests. He's talking about the scribes. He's talking about the leaders of the nation, you know, uh, from the prophet to the priest uh, and, the, and the leaders of Jerusalem. They've, they've, they've given themselves over to this stuff. You know, the, the, the drug dealer in the alley, no, that's what they do. But these other guys are held to a higher standard. And, and sadly, <clears throat> they've strayed from the faith because of their greediness. In verse 11, it says, and For they've healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, uh, saying, Peace, peace, uh, when there is no peace. Understand, uh, verse 11 is uh, sarcasm. Okay? Uh, the, they, the prophets and the priests, have only given the people false hope. Uh, he says they've healed them slightly. <laughs> like, they haven't done much. Uh, to help them out. Uh, and, and basically, uh, they're, they're giving them a false hope, saying, peace, peace, when that will pointedly not be the case. Uh, these false prophets, are, even in that day during Jeremiah's time, were saying Jeremiah's full of, hot, you know, full of cold water, you know, full of hot air, and um, don't worry, the Babylonians aren't coming. You know, don't worry, you know, it, it's going to be okay. And Jeremiah's going to, uh-uh, you know. It's going to be really, really bad. And, uh, and they weren't doing anyone any favors by not dealing with the sin issue before them. I was having a conversation with somebody just the other day. 
<clears throat> about a situation, a common situation actually, uh, pastors and churches that allow uh, practicing uh, homosexuals or people engaging in adultery or other things like that to freely and knowingly attend their fellowship without being talked to or confronted or challenged in some way. And I mean lovingly. I don't mean like you just jump on them and throw them out the door. But, you know, and I've had to do that. Where people have come in and I've figured out after, you know, a time uh, that they're not married or whatever, but they're you know, living together what they're doing. And I don't jump bad on them, but I do talk to them. But the number of churches and pastors that will knowingly let uh, people like that that are engaged in those activities attend church. And, and, and again, when they do that and they know about it, they're actually affirming their behavior. They're, they're, and they're giving them a false sense of security, like, hey, you're okay. So why should they change their ways? But we know that people that are engaged in a lifestyle like that, and, and it doesn't matter if it's you know adultery or fornication or homosexuality or whatever, I'm, I'm not ripping the, the, the person in, in, in particular. I'm just saying that you know the Bible says that people that are engaged in those things will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. And when we sit here and just you know, make nice, nice with them and smile at them and nod and, and don't actually address the issue, we give them that false sense of security. What if they die the next day walking away from church? Or what if the rapture happens and they're the only ones left in church and we haven't said something to them? Their blood literally is on our hands. And, and it's sad because those are the people that have been affirmed that way that one day perhaps will be the ones saying, Lord, Lord, didn't I go to church? You know, didn't I do these nice things or whatever? And, uh, and, and our Lord Jesus is going to say, you know, away from me, I never knew you. I'm kind of loosely paraphrasing Matthew 7, uh, 21 and forward. But <clears throat> it, it just like these false prophets, they've helped my people a little. You know, he's being sarcastic. Um, sadly, you know, there, there is no, Isaiah tells us, Isaiah 48, 22, there is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. They're not going to know the peace. Uh, they, they can't know peace until they know the Prince of Peace. Now, in verse 12, he says, Were they ashamed when they committed abomination? No. My Bible's got no with an exclamation point in it. You know, it's like, no. Uh, they were not at all ashamed, nor did they know how to blush. Uh, therefore, they shall fall among those who fall, and in the time of their punishment, they shall be cast down, says the Lord. They're not just going to fall down. They're going to be cast down, okay? Our Lord is going to do that. And it's like, wow. Um, they had or they have no shame for their sin. Uh, they are shameless. Uh, this is uh, the old King James word of wantonness. You know, they're wanton in their behavior. They are shameless. Uh, like it says here, they don't even know how to blush, you know? And, and I tell you what, being a cop was a real eye-opener. And I, I began to see people earlier in my career that did certain things, but later in my career, they're walking out the, down the street openly doing the things uh, in front of people and didn't care. You know, and, you know, they have these, I don't ever encourage you uh, to look at a gay pride parade, uh, but having been to several where I used to work, it is horrific the things that they do in public. And on any, any given day of the year, you, as a cop, you see an individual doing that, Man, I rush in there and I hook them up, throw them in the car, and book them as fast as I can. But on, on those particular days, it's like the cops, you, you can't go in. You, you'd be arresting hundreds of people. You'd cause this huge you know, political thing, all that kind of stuff. But they get away with so much and they're shameless. Their, their wantonness is on public display. But it says because of that, they're going to go down. They're not just going to go down, they're going to be cast down. In verse 13, it says, I will surely consume them, says the Lord. So God's not letting them get away with it. He says, I will, I, will, I will surely consume them, says the Lord. Uh, no grapes shall be on the vine, no figs on the fig tree, and the leaf shall fade. And, and the things I've given them shall pass away from them. You know, you think back to the promises uh, to the nation of Israel as they were coming out of Egypt. Where is he going to take them? To, quote, unquote, the land of promise. To a place that was, what, flowing with milk and honey. Uh, a prosperous place. There would be cities and homes that were already built. You're just going to move into them. You're going to take vineyards and you're going to bring your flocks to well-watered places and you're going to thrive and you're, you're going to just have a great life if you'll just walk in my ways. <laughs> you know, that's a huge if. 
but God brought them into a land of plenty, and now he's telling them, you know what? I'm going to consume you. There won't be any grapes or no figs, no leaves. It kind of sounds like drought and it sounds like famine uh, that's used in judgment. You know, we read in Joel chapter 1, verse 16 and, and forward, it says, Is not the food cut off before our eyes, uh, joy and gladness from the house of our God? The seed shrivels under the clods. Uh, storehouses are in, in shambles. Barns are broken down. Uh, for the grain is withered. How the animals groan. The herds of cattle are restless because they have no pasture. Even the flocks of sheep suffer punishment. You know, there won't, be an, there won't be food for animals. There won't be food for people. There's going to be a terrible famine. And, you know, <clears throat> that's, you see that at different times. But, you know, Jesus even, you know, if God wants to dry it up or curse it, uh, he can do that. Uh, in Matthew 21, verse 19, remember, our Lord seeing the fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves. And he said to it, let no fruit grow on you ever again. And immediately the fig tree withered. It's like, whoa. <laughs> you know, he expected to find fruit, didn't find it. It's so, okay, you're done. You know, and that was that. And it's like, whoa, Lord, how many bear fruit? How many bear fruit? <laughs> you know, but it's but he's telling them that's going to be part of the the judgment that's coming upon them. Uh, in verse 14, uh, why do we sit still? Uh, assemble yourselves and let us enter the fortified cities and let us be silent there. Uh, for the Lord our God has put us to silence and given us water of gall to drink because we have sinned against the Lord. Again, he's giving us the reasons for all these things. But when he asked that question, you know, why did we sit still? Why are we sitting here? Why are we doing something? What are you doing? <clears throat> and so he's, he's challenging them. Uh, and, and it's, you know, better get moving because judgment's on the way. Run to your fortified cities. You know, why are you just standing there? Do something. Uh, and then it says they've been put to silence. In, uh, I, I forget where it's at. It's in, in Luke's gospel. But at one point, <clears throat> the king puts on a wedding for his, for his son. And he's sent out his invitations and nobody responds. They've all got something else to do. And so the king sends the servants out to the highways and the byways and they bring a bunch of people into the feast. And so the, the, now the, the, the hall is filled and they're enjoying the feast. The king walks in and he finds a guy who's not wearing wedding clothes. He's not wearing the right kind of garments. And he, and he says, friend, why aren't you wearing <clears throat> the wedding clothes? And it says that the guy was speechless. And then the king said, take him, bind him, <clears throat> and throw him outside where there'll be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And it's a, it's a type, it's a, it's a model of we have, to get into heaven, we have to be wearing his righteousness, we have to be wearing the right clothes, the, the righteousness that he gives us. But when he was confronted... He couldn't say anything because every guest that was there was offered a change of clothes. And he apparently refused it, but still got in. And so when, when God calls us on the carpet uh, about our sin, not us because our sins are paid for, but they will have no excuses. They won't be able to say anything. And it's the same thing here. They've been put to silence because he is righteous and holy and true. What can we say? We're her sinners. And so the same thing there. And then the, the real reason uh, because we have sinned against the Lord, uh, and we all have, but the difference between repentant and non-repentant. Uh, verse 15, uh, we look for peace, uh, but no good came. And for a time of health, and, and there was trouble. And so we're looking for the good news. The, the false prophets talked about it, but there wasn't any. The false prophets said all kinds of stuff, trying to placate people, trying to tickle their ears, trying to make them feel good. And what came of that? Nothing uh, but despair. Uh, later in uh, Jeremiah uh, chapter 14, uh, verse 19, Jeremiah says, Have you utterly rejected Judah? I think he's talking to God. Has your soul loathed Zion? Uh, why, have you for, why have you stricken us so that there's no healing for us? Uh, we looked for peace, but there was no good for the time of healing, and, and, and there was trouble. It's the same thing. So they're, look, they, they're looking for some kind of hope in the midst of this judgment, but God's already decreed this judgment. There is no hope beyond Jesus, beyond God's word. And, uh, and so they're, they're looking for something else. Uh, this reminds me a lot of the beginning of Isaiah. 
uh, in Isaiah chapter 1, verses 4, 5, and 6, uh, here the prophet records, Alas, sinful nation, uh, a people laden with iniquity, uh, a brood of evildoers, children who are corruptors. Uh, they have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away backwards. Why should you be stricken again? Uh, will you revolt more and more? The whole head is sick. The whole heart faints. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed or bound up or soothed with ointment. The, 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 the prophet is kind of, hey, you've been thrashed, man. Do you really need, you know, do you need to be hit again? Do you need to be chastened again? Do you need more of this same kind of treatment? You're messed up. And, and Jeremiah is kind of almost feeding them the same line, a little different way, but <clears throat> basically they're refusing to relent. They, they will not yield, and they're going to pay a heavy price for that. Uh, in verse 16, uh, the snorting of his horses was heard from Dan. Uh, the whole land trembled at, his, at, at the sound of the neighing of his strong ones. For they have come and devoured the land and all that is in it, the city and those who dwell in it. And so the, at this point, actually, uh, the Babylonian cavalry uh, was already taking parts of uh, the north part of the country there at Dan. And so, you know, word gets back, people are trembling, it's, it's, a, it's a big deal. Uh, and the land was actually trembling because of these ominous uh, events. But, but look at the passage here a little closer for just a second. Uh, verse 16. It says the snorting of his horses. Whose horses? God's. It, his horses in the sense that they are his servants. They're his instrument of judgment. Uh, the whole land trembled at the sound of his strong ones. Again, uh, all this judgment is coming directly from the hand of our God. And, uh, and here it says that literally they are his. Now, he'll, he'll deal with the Babylonians later, but for right now, they are his chosen instrument of judgment upon uh, the nation. Again, these are ominous events. Uh, verse 17, For behold, I will send serpents among you, uh, vipers which cannot be charmed, and they shall bite you, says the Lord. You know, the, the Babylonians are coming. That's what I'm already done. I mean, okay, Lord, what do you want me to do? You know, the Babylonians are coming. It's going to be really bad. Uh, and he goes, oh, by the way, and I'm sending snakes too. <laughs> And, okay, and, and hornets, you know, and, and, uh, and, you know, I don't know, but it, it's like if you thought you could handle the Babylonians, try the snakes, you know, and, and, and remember back in, uh, in Numbers when the children of Israel complained about the manna and God sent the, uh, the, the fiery serpents into the camp and then because people were dying and crying out, you know, God talked uh, or Moses talked to God and God says, hey, you know, make a brass serpent, put it up on a stick, hold it up, and when the people look at it, you know, they'll be saved. Do you notice that that part of this passage is missing? <laughs> because it, it, it's intended to create fear. It's intended uh, that there would be no remedy. Uh, this is what you've got coming. And, uh, and, and it, like I said, this is pretty a, a pretty ominous chapter. Uh, verse 18 uh, I would comfort myself in sorrow. My heart is faint in me. And so I think this is the prophet coming to grips with or realizing the extent of what's happening here. And Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet for a reason. You know, he's seeing this, and, and even though they've got it coming, you know, uh, in spades, if you will, uh, he does not, he's not enjoying what's happening to them. Uh, he's not in that place of, aha, you know, you had it coming kind of thing. Uh, he is devastated at the devastation that's going to take place uh, there in Judah. And, and God is going to hit them from every angle. And so the prophet is trying to comfort himself. He sees all too vividly the destruction of his people, and it is, you know, breaking his heart. In verse 19, he says, Listen, uh, the voice, the cry of the daughter of my people from a far country is not the Lord in Zion, is not her king in her. And so I'm trying to honestly figure out if this is the prophet still or if this is God. Um, because the cry of 
the daughter of my people. That could be that could be Jeremiah, but it could also be the Lord. Is not the Lord in Zion? Uh, you know, He's there. Is not uh, her king in her? And so it grieves him uh, what his people have done and, and what they're going to bring upon themselves. They have literally provoked the Holy One of Israel to anger uh, with the carved images and with their foreign idols and all that stuff. Uh, and then we get to verse 20. Uh, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. Uh, my pastor told me years ago that in his opinion, uh, this is hands down the saddest verse in all of Scripture. You know, they've gotten to the place where the jig is up, and we're not saved. And um, it's like, wow. But but you know what? And when it says there, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved, it's not because God didn't want to save them. It's because they didn't want to get saved. It's because they rejected uh, the, the one who could save them. They rejected his word. And, um, you know, they brought in the harvest, but there will be no celebration. And I'm again reminded of, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. We uh, The parallels between this study and what we're studying on Sunday with the, the seals being broken. But in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever. There is, you know, God is gracious and he's merciful, but he's also righteous and holy and true. And there comes a point when in his righteousness he has to act uh, in judgment and so here it is and so he will not strive with man forever and then in verse 21 it says for the hurt of the daughter of my people i am hurt uh, i am mourning uh, astonishment has taken hold of me and i believe that this is the prophet is jeremiah uh, he is hurting because they are they are they soon will be hurting he he, he sees what they're going to go through and uh, they're not changing their course. They're not repenting. They're not relenting. They're not humbling themselves. And he is mourning. Uh, he is astonished uh, at the breadth of the destruction uh, that will overtake them. And as you read this in, uh, in Ezekiel uh, chapter 33, verse 11, it says, Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked would turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why should you die, O house of Israel? And so God doesn't take pleasure in this, certainly. And I, I believe that the prophet Jeremiah reflects the heart of God, that as much as it displeases God, it grieves Jeremiah as well. And then we get to verse 22. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Uh, why then is there no recovery for the health of the daughter of my people? And so he's asking the question, perhaps it's a rhetorical question, but apparently there is no balm, uh, there is no soothing, uh, there is no making this better or easier or, uh, you know, uh, lighter in some respect. Uh, uh, there's no healing ointment that can fix this. Uh, Gilead, uh, up in the northern part of the country, uh, was a place where they grew the tabernacle tree uh, from which they made a balm, a, a healing balm, kind of an herbal remedy of sorts, if you will, uh, that helped people out. And the question is, isn't there something like that that will heal what ails us, you know, that can fix this in some way? And we're left hanging here because I, when you turn to the next chapter uh, and the first verse, although my head were waters, my eyes were tears, you know, he's weeping at this point. There is no fix. This is just what's going to happen. And as I was looking over this, it started to kind of dawn on me a little bit, uh, you know, the different things that are happening. So I want to give you just a real brief little summary uh, because their refusal to repent would lead to this terrible judgment. But in this chapter, there are 10 things uh, that are brought out that are going to come upon them. Uh, in verses 1 and 2, we see that their bones are going to be scattered uh, the desecration that's going to take place and the plunder, not just of the tombs, but of the city. Uh, in verse 3, we see that the children of that wicked family are cursed. 
And so I, I do believe it's speaking specifically of Jeconiah's family or uh, uh, Jehoiakim, <clears throat> uh, that all his descendants are, are toast in some way, cursed. Uh, in verse 10, it says that the family is going to be broken up. Basically, as the men are killed, uh, the wives are given away to the conquerors, and, uh, and their land are given away as well. Uh, in verse 13, it says that basically the crops are going to be ruined, and uh, they're going to be a, a drought, a famine, whatever's happening there, but you know God's going to see to that. Uh, in verse 14, uh, they're given water of gall, uh, a bitter, poisonous kind of water to drink, and, um, and that's not going to be pleasant. Uh, verse 15, uh, he's looking for peace, but there is none. And then he's got bad health. And so it's like, you know, they got bad health, they got snakes, they got, you know, the Babylonians, all this stuff happening. <clears throat> in fact, uh, that's the next thing in verse 17 is the, uh, the venomous snakes. Uh, they're going to come in and bite them. And, and, uh, and then in verse 20, uh, it says basically they have no hope. Uh, you know, the summer's passed, the harvest has passed, the summer, you know, we're not saved. And so, uh, sadly, uh, they've missed the boat. They've missed the opportunity. Uh, in verse 21, it says, and I didn't, I didn't actually talk about this too much, but the word hurt there, uh, for the hurt of the daughter of my people, uh, in, in my Bible, New King James, it says hurt. Um, in other translations, uh, NIV, I think, says crushed. Uh, in the NASB and some other translations, it says broken or brokenness. And so I, I'll lump it all together. It'll be like the Amplified Bible. Are hurt, crushed, and broken. And that's what's going to happen to them. They're going to be hurt, crushed, and broken. Um, and then verse 22, finally, uh, there's no cure. Uh, there's no remedy. These things are just going to have to play out. And uh, now you, you can see why, and then we'll see it in the next, next chapter, why Jeremiah is the weeping prophet. He is weeping. Now, there is actually a cure, and they can have hope, but it means humility and brokenness, and it means repentance. You know, we, we take all these things, we look at all this stuff, and we say, okay, we can see the parallels. And, uh, you know, the Bible tells us, Paul writes, you know, in Romans 6.23, the wages of de uh, sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We have that option. And the only cure for sin is repentance and the forgiveness that comes through the shed blood of Jesus. They're looking to things that won't help. They have kind of a anything but Jesus attitude. And I, I've met people like that. You know, they're, they're, they'll go to any kind of, you know, pop psychology thing. They'll, they'll look at, you know, Dear Abby or Dear Blabby, or they'll look at all kinds of different things out there. Anything but Jesus, you know, and they'll, they'll, they'll try every cure. They'll eat the weirdest stuff and do the cleanses and all those things. Uh, but anything but Jesus. And, and sadly, Jesus is the only one that can help them. Uh, they refuse to humble themselves before a righteous and loving father who, who wants to forgive them. Their hearts have grown hard towards God. They've rejected his word, uh, which is so sad because he and his word are the balm are the cure that they're looking for. And it's just like, I, I remember feeding my kids and my grandkids over the years. You know, you get a baby that's hungry and they've, they've gone from, you know, maybe the bottle so much to uh, the green food in their jar. And, uh, <laughs> and you start trying to feed them. And it, it's like you're, you're, they, they close their lips. No, you know, no, no, no. They start crying. They turn their head. You stick it in their ear. You stick it in their eye. It's going up their nose. And, uh, you know, you can't get it in them. And finally, by accident, you get a gulp in there. And, uh, and you see them. And it's like, hey, that's good, you know. And they give them another shot, another shot. And they start, you know, choking that down. And it's, you know, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are those that put their trust in him. And, uh, and that's what we're called to. We're, we're seeing this example. And I'm thinking, okay, Lord, how do I apply this to my life? And the only thing I can think to do is to do the opposite of what they're doing. Because what they're doing is bringing all this, this, this hardcore judgment upon them, right? So I want to do the opposite. I want to I revere God's word and pay attention to it. I want to receive, you know, his direction in my life. 
Uh, I want to be yielded to everything he wants me to do. I want to try and be obedient in, in, in every way that I can be by the grace of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit working in me. And I want to do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And, uh, and I think if we, if we just stick with that, we're going to do pretty good. And so there, there's lessons to be learned on both sides of the equation here. Gracious Father, we thank you uh, for, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for your love. Uh, we thank you for this uh, ominous um, word, really, in your, in, in your word, Father, about what happened to the nation of Judah. And, and help us, Lord, even though we live in the same kind of a culture, uh, not to make the same mistakes, Lord, but to be yielded to everything you want to do, Lord, and to walk in your ways and just to trust you. We love you, Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if you're able, let's stand together and close in worship. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word tonight. We thank you for the opportunity just to be here because we know that your word leads us to you, Lord, and that's where we want to be. We want to be with you, Lord. We know that you're coming soon. We know that you're going to call us to be with you. And help us, Lord, to be prepared for that moment. Help us to be yielded to everything you want to do and to be walking in your ways, abiding in you, waiting, watching, looking, praying, seeking your face. Lord, guide us by your spirit to do those things. We love you so much, Lord, and we thank you for loving us. Guide us again. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord bless thee. The Lord bless thee. 
and keep thee. The Lord may his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee and be gracious unto thee the lord lift up the lord lift up his countenance his countenance upon thee and give thee peace isn't it nice singing a prayer like that i love it i pray god blesses you guys tonight i pray that you have just a good night's rest and that you, you think about him as you fall asleep and, and wake up praising his, his holy name. God bless you guys. If you need prayer for any reason, come on up. Love to pray with you. Have a good night. And the crowd went wild. <laughs>